Good morning. Uh, my name is Keith Wallach and welcome to the webinar on high risk situations and how to deal with them as it pertains to uh, substance abuse. First thing I, I want to talk about is triggers and a little bit about how triggers are formed. Think of it this way. After years of using substances, associations form. Associations form between people, places, things, moods, etc. And the drug of choice. Now, with the drug of choice being gone, you're still going to experience people, places, things, moods, whatever. So the longer and longer you use, the more and more associations you have, the more associations you have, the more triggers you have. The more triggers you have, the more thoughts of using you have. Now, I'm not going to lie to anyone. You're going to have thoughts of using to the day you die. But as long as you don't give in to them, and as long as you handle them in a proper way, a positive way, they will become less and less frequent and easier and easier to handle. So consider these triggers as high risk situations. And another way to put this is the earlier you identify the high risk situation, what is behind the high risk situation and get help, uh, the better off you are. So often, my clients have had these high risk situations, these triggers, and have done nothing about them. And have let it go on for days, weeks, or even months. Maybe thinking they could handle it, maybe thinking that it'll go away, um, but they end up using. And um, so remember, with high risk situations, identify it, as soon as you, you know, as soon as you can. And do the um, reflection about what's behind it and get help. Now, one thing I want to say too is, well, how do you identify this? We're, I mean, we're going to get into some things more on relapse prevention planning. But if you're involved in a 12-step program, uh, one of the things that uh, the 12 steps encourage you to do in, in step 10 is to do a daily self-inventory. Um, if you're not in a 12-step program or you haven't gone to the, to the 10th step, you can still do, do like a relapse prevention review, the relapse prevention inventory um, at the end of each day. And I would encourage this. I've read material where, and there's a lot of triggers out there, like I said, but I find that they, and research has found that um, there's 10 top ones. Um, the first one, and, and this is ranked. They've actually done studies and questionnaires with um, counselors did this with, with clients and had them rank their top 10 um, from one to 10. Um, the counselors gave them their top 10 or the 10 most uh, common reasons that people relapsed, common triggers, high risk situations that they relapsed and then they put it out to a questionnaire um, with, their, with their clients. 
you again voted on them. So here's the questionnaire and uh, the order in which um, clients ranked their top 10 triggers. And um, it's a pretty good list. And I found this with my clients that pretty much um, I agree with this ranking. So number one is uh, your first high risk situation, greatest high risk situation trigger is social pressures. Now, social pressures could either be direct social pressures, you know, someone offering you alcohol or drugs, or indirect. You know, maybe it's a billboard, maybe it's a movie, maybe it's a TV commercial. And it still triggers you. You know, it triggers the thought of using. So social pressures being around people, places, um, either direct or indirect, is number one. Number two is negative emotions. Okay, so negative emotions are things like depression, anxiety, um, stress, uh, grief, self-pity. All big triggers. Number three is just the opposite. Wanting to celebrate something. So I guess we would call those positive emotions. You know, getting a raise at work, um, getting a new job, um, celebrating the holidays. Okay. Number four, boredom. And boredom just doesn't have the, the obvious connotation, which is nothing to do. But boredom also means things like I can be bored with the daily routine of living. I can be bored with a relationship. I can be bored with a job. And maybe most important, I can be bored with sobriety. You know, no one else is having, you know, I'm not having any fun. I wonder what so-and-so is up to. You know, no one in deep yards they probably still use it. But you're missing the lifestyle. Number five is, is trying to switch. Not only, I mean, in their, their study, addictive, other addictive substances. You know, so in other words, you know, okay, it was that Coke who did it for me, but I'll just drink. No. Um, it's always going to lead you, any substance is going to lead you 90% of the time back to your drug of choice. And if it doesn't, now you have another addiction. So, you know, keep in mind that you can't switch to any other substance. Okay. You have to be clean and sober of everything. Um, all drugs affect, you know, the mesolimbic dopamine system in the brain. And that's why you can't substitute. The other thing you can't do, and I've seen this in clients, is substitute other addictive behaviors. You know, you can't become a workaholic. Um, because then, you know, you just get burned out and then I deserve to use. Or a gambler. Man, I lost all my money now. I might as well go back and use. So it, it usually leads you back. And if it doesn't, now you just have another addictive behavior. So five, again, is switching to other addictions or going into other addictive behaviors. Six is physical pain. And this, this is a legitimate one. Unfortunately, I've had clients that had legitimate physical issues, accidents and so on, and went on pain medication. Some of them even took it as prescribed, but were on it so long, and then the doctor just cut them off, and 
you don't want to be dope sick. And so you, you go and you deal with it, you know, um, someone went on the streets, heroin mixed with fentanyl. Physical pain is, is, is a legitimate issue. And I can see why clients use it. Mostly opiates, but, I, but I've had clients down their pain in alcohol or marijuana. So if you do have physical pain, number one, I encourage clients to do anything they can to deal with the pain um, before any type of opiate use. Uh, whether that be acupuncture, whether that be physical therapy, whether that be um, going to the chiropractor, whether that be 750 milligrams, a combination of uh, ibuprofen and Tylenol. Um, I was at a training years ago, and, and uh, I, this was pointed out to me, and I, I looked at it on, online and um, eventually did it myself when I had some minor uh, surgery on my mouth. Those are just as effective as painkillers. So 750 milligrams combination of, of what? 500 of one and 250 of another of ibuprofen and uh, Tylenol. Number seven, war stories, the glorifying. Oh man, you remember when uh, you and I did this or we did that? What does that do? It just, it just goes with uh, euphoric recall, okay? Gets you talking about it. Gets you thinking about the so-called good times. Eight. Money. Doesn't have to be a lot of money. Doesn't have to be a sudden amount of money. I mean, a lot of my clients work, you know, but payday was a big trigger. So keep in mind, money is um, number eight. Number nine is this. Thinking you can use a prescribed med medication even though you abused it in the past. So say, say you have a problem with opiates and you go to the dentist. Of course, you don't tell the dentist you have an addiction problem. But the dentist um, prescribes you some pain, medi you know, pain pills to, you know, deal with the surgery or, or whatever mouth issue you have. And you take them because you think that you'd handle them as prescribed this time, which is just part of that denial. You know, you can't, you can't handle it. And then 10 is overconfidence. And overconfidence is usually after a period of time, you think you're cured. And that's a shame because you're never cured because it's an incurable disease. It's chronic and incurable. But some people think they can control it because they haven't used in, in years. And again, that's that denial coming back because if you're honest with yourself, you tried to control it, then um, why would it be any different now? It's not, you can't control it. So those, those are the top 10 triggers and um, high risk situations. Which I would encourage you, if if, if you you know if you're watching this, to do a daily self inventory, relapse self inventory on those ten. Okay. So example, say you're you're at the end of your day, and you're reviewing these ten. 
well, maybe maybe you felt you were angry. Okay, you identified it. Okay. Then you have to say to yourself, what made me angry today? Was I angry at a coworker? Was I angry at a family member? Was I angry at myself? Then the third part is, how do I deal with my anger? Okay. Um, do I write it down in a journal? Do I call my sponsor? Do I call someone else? Maybe I work out. But what we're trying to say here is, you identified it as quick as you can. You didn't let it linger. Identify and get help, okay? Swallow that pride. None of us can do it alone. So that is my thing on triggers and cravings and thoughts of using. One thing too, as long as you do something positive, that average thought um, and I put thoughts, cravings, you know, all together. We'll go away within five to seven minutes. Now, of course, if you're in early recovery and you're, uh, you've had some physical addicting symptoms, such as hardcore alcohol use with the shakes and tremors or opiate abuse, you know, the dope sickness, you know, it's going to become hours you know throughout the day but again as long as you do something positive to deal with it they'll become less and less frequent and easier and easier to handle i now want to talk about we talked about the high risk situations we talked about triggers and I want to talk about how that goes into, you know, relapse. And I'm going to get, you know, a little more specific. First of all, with relapse, you can never have relapsed if you were never in recovery. So if, if you were in treatment and everything because of the court system and you never, uh, and after you got off probation, you went back to use, and that's not relapse. So for relapse to happen, you have to have a period of recovery. In, you. in other words, working some type of recovery program. Having said that, just because we're talking about relapse doesn't mean it's going to happen. You'll hear people say that relapse is part of this disease, and it is, but that doesn't mean you have to relapse because relapse is, well, every one of us has one more relapse in us, but we don't know we have another recovery in us. So I just wanted to explain that before I start talking more about what relapse is. So here is some more things on relapse, what it is, and some ways to prevent relapse. One of the most dangerous characteristics of the disease of addiction is the tendency of people to relapse, especially in the first few months. And, and that ties in with the chemistry in the brain, okay? Where, you know, your brain usually within six months will repair itself, but it's still trying to get itself back together. And um, you go through a variety of, of things, um, increased cravings, thoughts of using, being one of them, but also other triggers such as mood swings, trouble sleeping, trouble in concentrating, trouble in remembering. The 12 steps of, of AA and NA do not teach a person how not to drink or use. It teaches a person how to live in a responsible and rewarding manner. As a person in recovery continues to grow along this new path, he or she moves further away from a possible relapse. 
got some good news. You know, if you're working a program of recovery, the longer and longer you do this, the better off you are. Okay. However, you're not safe. I've had clients that had 20 years sober. Stop going to meetings, you know, one thing led to another, I can use again and boom. So as our founder once said, uh, the founder of AA, uh, Bill W said, you can be sober two months, two years or 20 years. And if you pick it up, you're gonna start right back where you were and it'll get worse. That's that progression. When the chemically dependent person stops growing, he or she begins to slip into a pattern, which will eventually lead to chemical abuse. Again, so we, we we're again, as I said in the beginning, we're talking about high risk situations, triggers. The earlier you get it, the better off you are. Relapse is a process, not an event. Absolutely, it can be changed or interrupted at any time. There are warning signs and symptoms which a recovering person can detect to forewarn him or her of the potential danger. And I already went over those with triggers, okay? Top 10 triggers. Relapse is a process. It begins long before using, absolutely. A person will relapse um, before he or she picks up. Definitely, it starts in the mind. There's a saying, recovery is like walking up a down escalator. It's impossible to stand still. Now relapse warning signs or clues can relate to changes in behavior, attitude, feelings, thoughts, or any combination of these. You need to become aware and alert regarding possible changes and look for relapse clues. So we're gonna go more in depth, okay? You know, some of these things I, I've already, I think all of them go into those top 10 triggers that I've already went over, but um, this goes a little more in depth. Number one, changes in thoughts, switching addiction, substituting drugs, you know, again, quitting alcohol, but smoking weed, thinking I'm cured, Believing that I deserve to drink or use since I've been sober six months. Any changes in your thoughts, feelings, behaviors, or attitudes can indicate a relapse in motion. Changes in feelings or moods. An increase in moodiness or depression. Strong feelings of anger. Rage. Increased feelings of boredom. Sudden feelings of euphoria. And that those the euphoria is those positive emotions that I talked about. Changes in attitude. I don't care attitude. I don't care about myself. I don't care about sobriety. Becoming too negative about life in tunnel vision. In other words, just, just thinking and focusing on the negatives. Behavior changes. Increased episodes of arguing with others for no apparent reason. Forgetting to take your prescribed medication if needed. And what they mean by that is you know, 50% of the people in this country who have a mental health problem also have a drug and alcohol problem. They're self-medicating. And relapse in one is always going to lead to relapse in another. So you have to take your mental health meds. You, you know, you have to work on that just as well as you have to work on your recovery from substance abuse. Stop going to meetings. Stop into that bar. Think you could have a pop. Increasing food, cigarettes, candy, caffeine. And caffeine is a problem for two things. Um, number one, of course, it's a stimulant. And, I, and I've had clients who were addicted to meth and cocaine and um, tried to replicate that feeling by slamming energy drinks and leaders of pop and of course you can't get that and it just triggers them for the real thing. But the second problem is my clients that have uh, mental health problems and are on mental health meds. Um, caffeine is of course a stimulant, you urinate more frequently and you um, 
thus don't get the right levels of the medication. So again, watch the caffeine use. You know, um, one or two cups of coffee or one or two pops a day is probably okay. But when you start drinking pots of coffee and liters, and you're really hurting yourself. The second part of this is the road to relapse. Watch for the signs of relapse. Okay. Always remember too that denial is part of this disease. Okay, and it's denial that says things like, you could have another, you're gonna be all right, you can handle it this time, okay. In the big book, they have a saying this is a disease that's cunning, baffling, and powerful. What it means to me is denial. You always have to be on your guard. Okay. Um, rest of your life. There's another saying in the rooms of AA and NA that all the while that you're in recovery, your disease is just in the parking lot, doing push-ups, getting stronger, meaning you always have to be on your guard. You need to take daily self-monitoring steps long before you relapse. Again, you got to regularly note the signs that point the way for you. Your chances of avoiding relapse are then much stronger. That's that daily self-inventory. Relapse is a process that starts long before you actually return to using. Relapse is a progression of symptoms, often activated by post-acute withdrawal. And post-acute withdrawal is what I alluded to earlier. It happens really, especially in the first six months, but includes mood swings, um, increased cravings, moodiness, um, memory loss, trouble concentrating, trouble sleeping. Remember, too, that relapse can have signs that appear in all areas of your life. Okay. Um, you know, I, I only use one example of physical pain, you know, in the top 10 for physical. I, I, I mentioned a lot for mental health, emotional. And of course, relationships I talked about with um, social pressures and, and things like that, or things not going well in a relationship. But one of the things, too, that's also, you know, your spirituality. And in my opinion, you have to have some kind of basis with a higher power. It doesn't have to be God. Okay, I've had clients tell me it was a beauty of nature. I had clients tell me that their higher power was the fellowship of AA or NA. Um, keep in mind that spirituality is different from religion. But you do need that, that spirituality because in my opinion, addiction is a negative higher power. So now you have to replace it with a positive higher power, something above and beyond you that's there to help keep you sober. Some of the first signs of relapse is, is usually some type of stress combined with denial. So they want you to think of this spiral as a tornado, okay? And it starts with a whirlpool of symptoms begin at the top and they get worse. Again, that's why I've, I, I said some of my clients have been sober days, weeks, or even months before they've gone and used. So here's the spiral. Okay, starts off with denial. I'll never use again. 
imposing sobriety on others. Now, not everyone's going to have these things. Defensiveness, other compulsive, impulsive behaviors. Those are, you know, overeating, spending, gambling, working, what I talked about. Loneliness, tunnel vision, just seeing the negatives, the minor depression, loss of a daily structure. Notice how they get worse and worse. Plans begin to fail. Daydreaming. Feeling nothing can be solved. Confusion. Irritation with people. Irregular eating. Restless. Irregular sleeping. Daily routines we start becoming haphazard. Now deep depression. Irregular attendance at meetings. I don't care attitude. Open rejection of help. Dissatisfaction with life. Feeling helpless, self-pity, thoughts of social use, conscious lying, loss of confidence, resentments. Stopping all recovery efforts, overriding frustration, and then you finally pick up and use. The third thing I want to talk about in, in the, the relapse prevention is, and if you've been in the rooms, you, you've heard this think and think, addictive thinking, okay? Um, I'm going to read some of the most common statements of uh, addictive thinking. And think back in your mind if you've done any of these okay and they we're going to use i statements the more you check off the more in danger you are so consider this part of the daily self-inventory too you know you need to even get more uh, specific i do not go to aa or na meetings on a regular basis when i do go i don't listen to what others say I often pass or say something of a general nature. I allow myself to become overly tired, sometimes to the point of exhaustion. I begin to tell little lies or fail to tell the whole truth. I make up little stories, often for no apparent reason. I become impatient with myself and other people. I quit going to aftercare. I eat on an irregular basis, often missing several meals in a row. I pay little attention to the nutritional value of what I eat. I get angry and argumentative, frequently over small matters of little or no significance. I spend much time thinking about the terrible things that have happened to me. I get really down on myself. And I don't think anyone really cares about what happens to me. I don't feel like anything is going my way. I'm very frustrated at the actions of other people, particularly those closest to me. I have very high expectations. Even if I do, even if they do sound unrealistic, I expect great things. I think I've overreacted to the dangers of just putting your choice, alcohol, heroin, coke, it's just not that big a thing. I proclaim I'll never take a drink as long as I live. It would be in a case of suicide. I don't think I need to pay daily attention to something so obvious. I'm getting sick and tired of people questioning me about my sobriety. And I know what they're thinking even when they don't ask. I don't need the help of other people. I'm responsible for my own actions and would appreciate everyone recognizing that fact. I think about drinking and use quite often. After all, I had some fantastic times before the chemicals really got to me. I feel like I've lost control of my life 
almost as if I've been smoking again or drinking again, or you just put in your, you know, your, their thing. I have a hard time concentrating on anything for more than a few seconds. I think things are so bad in my life that they can't get much worse. I don't even think drinking or using can mix me up more than what I already am. I get tired of hearing about that higher power stuff. I can stand on my own two feet. I know so many people who drink and use too much. They need to wake up and stop being stupid. Their lives are really becoming a mess. Basically, what we call that, you're uh, taking someone else's inventory, not looking at you. Step four. And it goes, it's titled, when you have the desire to use, take action. Okay? Be prepared. There are many ways to help yourself when you feel like using. And again, remember, if you do something positive, that thought, craving, whatever, is going to go away within five to seven minutes. Examples of thoughts, feelings, and attitudes. I wanted to drink so bad I could taste it. Or my using dreams were so real that I'd wake up in a panic. I couldn't drive by the park without thinking about getting high. Well, here's some of the things you can do. All right. You could talk to other people. I mean, you know, Dr. Bob and Bill W. found, you know, when they found the AA back in 1935, realized that talking to other people about this helped them. So get on your phone to a sponsor. Get on to an, a contact person. Maybe you have a sober friend or, or a supportive family member. You know, I always tell my clients to get uh, five to 10 phone numbers of contact people and uh, use support for them. Okay, do something to take your mind off of it. You know, maybe it's a simple thing as getting something to eat. Maybe it's exercise. Um, I've had clients tell me that, that they'll, they'll do a hobby, um, try to read a book, anything, get your mind off of it. Change the thoughts, okay, that, that are negative into something positive. So in other words, and again, this, this might take time, especially if you're a person that dwells on the negative. But an example would be of the negative. I can't stand this. Okay. I can wait. I can't wait till tomorrow. Would be more positive. It would feel so good, which is a negative. The positive is remember the bad things that happen when you use. And in the rooms, they say that's playing that tape all the way through. Okay. Um, and what they mean by that is. You know, you think about what those so-called good times were, all right, and you play it all the way through to, no, nah, well, look what, what, what it led me, you know, and the consequences. A negative thought would be, this is impossible. A positive one is, I can do it today. So it's important, too. To list some of the negative consequences of your reuse. Re remember the pain, revisit the pain. Okay, close your eyes and visualize it. And then list some of your own positive thoughts. And the good consequences of maintaining sobriety. If you have to, rework step one. We were powerless over blank and our lives have become unmanageable. You know, I always teach to my clients that step one is the step that gets you out of denial and keeps you out of denial, okay? And I always break down powerlessness as loss of control and unmanageability as negative consequences of use. So what they're saying by reworking step one is if you think you can go back and use again, okay, what were the times I lost control? And loss of control could be amount used, uh, time spent using, time spent recovering, time spent getting the drugs. 
Um, and what was my negative consequences? Legal, financial, relationships, whatever. The old timers of AA will say that step one is the only step that you have to try to do perfectly. The next way to do deal with things, utilize that higher power. And, and earlier I talked about the importance of a higher power. You know, meditate, pray, ask for help. Okay, your, your higher power, again, should be your most important relationship. Your higher power won't let you down. You know, if you have to drop to your knees and ask for help from your higher power, do it. Don't get off your knees until that urge or craving is gone. You know, they always say in the rooms, you know, you need to hit your knees in the morning to ask your higher power for strength to get through the day and then hit your knees at night to thank him for getting you through this day. The fifth thing I want to talk about is stress and addiction. Often addicted people begin using alcohol and other drugs to relieve their feelings of stress. Drinking, popping pills, whatever is a way to relax. So you got to reduce the stress in your life. Hopefully you now realize that the alcohol and the drugs were just temporary rewards, which offered a temporary escape from your problems. The chemicals added more stress, more anxiety, and more fear to your life. Since you're now hopefully working a program of sobriety and going out into the world, which will again be stressful, okay, resulting in anxiety and stress, you have to be dealing with these things in positive ways instead of the negative, which before was using drugs or alcohol. Especially in early recovery, people wonder these things. How can I get through a day at work without a little chemical help? How can I go to a party or dance without being high? How can I sit in class all day without smoking weed or drinking? How can I work around others that use? First of all, some of the situations, you know, um, when I talk about social pressures, the things you can avoid, avoid, okay? So chances are, why would I want to go to a dance or party if alcohol and drugs are there? So avoid those. The other things, like the, the situation at work or whatever, you're going to have to deal with them. You, know, you have to have positive coping. Part six, being honest can and will reduce stress. Remember in, in, in the meetings, we say, this is an honest program of recovery. Inner peace come, be, comes with being honest. People who abuse alcohol and drugs find it impossible to lead honest lives. They must always be making up stories, excusing, conning, lying, you know, not only with themselves, but with others and also their higher power. Always scrambling to cover up their addictive behavior, you know. However, one of the slogans in the room is one day at a time, okay? Strive for honesty in all your affairs, doings and behaviors, one day at a time. As a result, those feelings of fear and tension will be reduced and eliminated. Section seven, one day at a time. Okay. Two of the most unrewarding emotions are guilt and worry. And most addicted people are filled with both. On one hand, we dwell on yesterday and build up huge amounts of guilt. On the other hand, when we are not beating ourselves with guilt, we look into the future and create great mountains of worry.
As a newly recovering person, you cannot allow guilt, shame, worry, and anxiety to control your attitude. You must focus on the moment. When you do that, the guilt of the past failures and the worry of the future will give up their control of your life. You will feel more peace. Many addicted people drank and used in order to hide from guilt and worry. Living a sober life requires a concentration on the activities and issues of today. Let go of yesterday. Let tomorrow wait. Today is completely ours. Use it and enjoy it. Eight, some ways and strategies to reduce and eliminate that stress in your life. Exercise, okay? Brisk walking, ride a bike, jogging, swimming. Remember, easy does it. Don't try to catch up in one day or one month. Check with your doctor first regarding the condition of your physical health. And again, moderation because I've had some clients who used exercise and it became an addiction unto itself. Get straight financially. Applying the 12 steps and the other tools of recovery to your financial matters can be a very important way to reduce stress. If you're behind in your bills or your family obligations, start by getting things down on paper. Ask for help. Prepare a simple plan that identifies how much money comes in and where it must go. When you, when you talk to your creditors, tell them what you can do, then do it. I've had this, I've recommended this for clients, go to consumer credit counseling, okay? Especially for uh, credit card debt. They can help you consolidate your bills, make a list of monthly bills. They'll maybe even talk to your creditors, you know, to set up realistic payments. Reaching out to others for help. Again, swallow that pride, okay? You're not alone. Your recovery involves other people, sponsor. Contacts from the meetings, family can provide you with support. But you gotta reach out for this help. You gotta build that support system. You gotta get a strong system and you gotta use that system. Listen to your body. Because stress has emotional, mental, and physical symptoms. So learn to listen to how your body is responding to you. When you're under stress, you'll get your own warning signs, which means you're being overloaded. It may be pain in your stomach, in the neck, your shoulders, headache, other signs. When you hear this kind of message, back up and ease off. Learn ways to avoid unnecessary stress. Again, some of the mental symptoms of stress is worrying. Same thought going over and over in your mind, which leads to not sleeping, which is also a problem. It becomes physical. You get worn down. You know, if you're having stomach problems, pain in your stomach, chances are you're not eating. So, again, listen to your body. Confront your fears and anxiety. If you know you're going to have a stressful, difficult situation in the near future, legal problems, divorce, whatever, write them down, get the support, okay, from your sponsor, other recovering people, counseling, minister, um, journal, you know, to get those feelings out and see how you're progressing or need to do better. Nine, reduce stress. Schedule wisely. Avoid overscheduling. You know, so many people, especially in early recovery, want to get those things back now, now, now. Okay? Your first priority is sobriety. Don't schedule too many activities for your day. If you must schedule tightly, provide for relaxation periods. Even, even 10 minutes of quiet time can help. Take brief periods of relaxation. Be kind to yourself. Make time for yourself. Personal space. Insist on having a time and place in your home in which you can be alone. When you feel that your space is being invaded, you're under stress. When privacy is a regular part of family life, there's less tension and stress. 
Develop a place for daily prayer, meditation, and review your inventory. Watch for the negatives. Be assertive. Okay, and that's this is a this is a way of expressing yourself that makes you feel good and doesn't hurt another person. It's something that we have to do, okay, because the other two choices are negative, being passive, or being aggressive. But being assertive means taking responsibility for and identifying and meeting your own needs. Communicate with others in an open, clear, and emotionally honest manner. Know your rights to stand up for them. Appreciate yourself, your strengths, your abilities, your uniqueness. Practice assertive techniques. Look at your rights and situation. Arrange a time and place to discuss your problems. Define the problem as you see it. Describe your feelings to others in I statements. Express your, your requests in an appropriate way. Reinforce what you want. Describe positive consequences if you get what you want personally, get what you personally want from another individual. Laugh at yourself. You know, try to find humor in your mistakes. Give yourself permission to be imperfect. Others will be more open with you, honest, helpful, and friendly. Um, and friendly communication will result. So, and that's so true. And if you go to meetings, you find a lot of laughter in those, in those meetings. People laughing at themselves. And that's a good thing. Share your secrets. Well, you know, they, 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 in, the, in the rooms they say, secrets keep us sick. Try to stay open to those people around you. Don't bottle up your secrets. Allow people to see the real you, the wonderful you. Use your sponsor, other recovering people, minister, priest, counselor, whatever. Try to schedule some time for fun. You may think that's easy to have fun, but unfortunately, in the past, you've associated it with drinking and drugging. So, you know, try to do some sober activities. And this is where AA comes in, you know, especially in, uh, in the Erie area where I'm from. Um, and especially before the, the pandemic, you know, they have sober retreats, they have sober bowling leagues, they have sober camping trips, um, a Waldemir day. I mean, I can go on and on, sober golf league, you know. So one of the good things of a sponsor is to help you with sober fun. 10, modify your diet. Proper nutrition helps the body well. helps the body get well and to heal. Choices on when to eat and what food to eat or avoid is an important part of recovery. Eat three balanced meals, three nutritious snacks a day. I've already talked about avoiding that, you know, avoiding the sugar and caffeine as much as possible. Your eating habits will influence how you feel, how you handle stress, your thinking skills, your energy level, and your ability to rest and sleep. In addition, many parts of your body may have been physically harmed by your use of alcohol and other drugs. By eating right, you give your body the necessary nutrients to repair itself. 11, develop a healthy eating style. Well, as Americans, we, we tend to eat and consume more than probably what we should of high levels of fat red meats, eggs, etc., white bread. Fruits, vegetables, and grains offers the great, greatest balance nutritional bargain. And they can reduce the food cravings. This helps a person in early recovery. It reduces mood swings and brings the body and mind into balance. Again, obviously, when you're, you're putting in amounts of sugar and caffeine, your body's and mood is going up and then you crash. Here's some other tips. Remember progress, not perfection. Celebrate your successes, but don't try to change your eating habits overnight. Find others who have moved or, or are moving toward healthier diets. Join them. Talk about new ideas, success, and frustrations. Most recovering alcoholics have blood sugar instability, so avoid long gaps between meals. Eat in small quality, qu quantities, five or six times a day. 
develop an interest in food and diet, be knowledgeable, eat a variety of foods, cut down on sugar, flour, fat, fatty foods, and sweets, exercise, increase your amount of vegetables and fruit. 12, sleeping right. Few addicted people are in the habit of getting a good night's sleep every night because most of your life centered around addiction and using chemicals, you know, to get yourself to bed or, you know, so on. So a healthy, regular patterns for being alert and active or at rest and asleep couldn't be attained. Your body was constantly reacting to stimulants or depressants and other drugs. Cravings kept you awake. Nightmares made sleep a frustrating alternative. Sweat-soaked sheets remind you of your chemical abuse. As was true in other parts of your life, you lost control of your ability to rest and sleep naturally. Your sleep patterns were altered as a result of your chemical abuse. 13, sleeping without drugs. Again, this is far, you know, we talked about how sleeping patterns were, um, or lack of sleep and, and things. is part of that post-acute withdrawal, and so it can take up to six months. But eventually, you will be able to sleep without drugs. And here are some other tips uh, from recovering people um, that aided them in their sleeping. I sometimes drink a warm glass of milk. I avoid eating before going to bed. I don't take naps during the day. I keep relaxing events in my evenings and confine my decision making and problem solving to the day. I avoid stimulants such as coffee, tea, cola, chocolate, particularly in the evening. I leave the bedroom, you know, another thing is leave the bedroom if you can't fall asleep after 20 minutes. Do something light and enjoyable. Read, listen to music, work on a hobby until you feel tired, then return to bed. If again, you are not asleep within 20 minutes, leave the bedroom and repeat your activity. Soon your bed and bedroom will be associated with the pleasantness of sound sleep, not the upsetting feelings of attempting sleep unsuccessful. Consider using progressive muscle relaxation tapes and sounds, the ocean, rainfall, running brook, et cetera, to assist with sleep. Also a shower before bedtime can assist with, with falling asleep. 14, your relapse prevention plan. So now we're, we're, we're summing up some of the things and these next things are just things to consider, okay? When you're doing a relapse prevention plan. Okay, um, again, relapse is a process and it's preventable. By addressing these questions that I'm going to give, you can become aware of possible relapse producing events or causes. This plan can work against your usual excuses. Please be specific and if possible, answer each question in mo with more than one answer. Remember, the more you put into it, the more you get out of it. One, how many 12-step meetings will you attend? Where, day, time. Two, what times did you use alcohol or drugs? What will you do instead during these times? Three, what actions will you take when you get angry, frustrated, stressed, or engage in negative thinking? Four, how will you begin each day? how you end each day. Five, when you feel lonely and bored, what actions are you going to take to deal with these feelings? Six, what are some actions you can take when you're not getting along with friends or family? Seven, what are some actions you can take if 12-step meetings begin to feel boring, monotonous, or unimportant? Eight, 
Describe how you will handle situations that make you afraid or induce fear and anxiety. Nine, what life events or losses could lead you to relapse? Ten, make a list of those people who can give you support in times of need without criticizing and judging you. Eleven, will you be able to ask these people for help? And write how you will do so. Twelve, how many times a day will you conduct inventory reviews? Remember, I said at least at the end of the day. Okay, but as, as many as you need. Thirteen, if you have identified examples of stinking thinking, how soon will you address these thinking patterns and with whom? Fourteen, develop an emergency sobriety card of names and numbers of five individuals you can call any time of the day if you need help. Um, and I, I, they say five, I say five to ten. And last, number 15, identify a place or places you can go in your house to have quiet time to reflect, meditate, review your program, or reduce stress. Well, this concludes um, my topic on high-risk situations, uh, triggers, relapse prevention, um, how to deal with, which is a way to deal, you know, ultimately with um, these triggers and high-risk situations. I hope you in, enjoyed your podcast, and I hope that this is very helpful.